Hello everyone and welcome to this Women in Science webinar. This is the first in a four-part series we're hosting this fall, co-produced by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News and the Rosalind Franklin Society. Today, to launch this series, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester in England to talk about the life and times of Rosalind Franklin. Our Women in Science series is co-sponsored by OnRamp and Horizon Discovery. Thanks to both of those great companies for their support. The Rosalind Franklin Society, for obvious reasons, is unable to host its annual symposium this year. So we're holding this online series, which will celebrate the legacy of Rosalind Franklin, who would have turned 100 this year, and champion the progress and highlight other outstanding issues impacting women in science from some fantastic female scientists later in the series. I'm your host for part one of this series, Kevin Davis, the executive editor for the CRISPR Journal, editor at large for Gen. I'm also the author of the new book, Editing Humanity, The CRISPR Revolution and the New Era of Genome Editing, which was published just 10 days ago here in the United States. Let's meet our special guest speaker for today's webinar. Matthew Cobb, PhD, is Professor of Zoology at the University of Manchester in England, where he researches the sense of smell and the history of science. He studied insect behaviour and pheromones for more than 40 years, with particular emphasis on Drosophila. But Matthew is also a prolific author of popular science books, including Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code, which was published in 2015, and most recently, the idea of the brain. He's currently working on a social history of genetic engineering with the working title Life Edited. Two quick housekeeping slides before we begin. First, a note that we have a series of great talks in this Women in Science series. In part two next week, we'll have a fireside chat with the renowned microbiologist Rita Colwell, who is the president of the Rosalind Franklin Society and the author of the new book, A Lab of One's Own. And then a week after that, a presentation from Susan Hockfield, president emerita of MIT and the author of The Age of Living Machines. Before we begin, we welcome your questions for Matthew, which we will take at the end of his presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So just hit the ask a question button at the top of your screen and submit. All right, intro's over. Let's get our series underway. Matthew, we're so looking forward to your talk about the life and legacy of Rosalind Franklin. Over to you. Hello, my name is Matthew Cobb. And I'm going to talk to you about the life and times of Rosalind Franklin, an extraordinary scientist. Now, most of us probably come into contact with Franklin first through the pages of the Double Helix by Jim Watson. Uh, and to be honest, this is a bit unfortunate because apart from the offensive descriptions of Franklin it contains, it also focuses our attention on just one moment in her career. In fact, even on a single photo and in reality, as I'll explain to you, she was so much more than that. But before we get on to that, let's see how young people today think about Franklin. Uh, we're going to see a little rap battle between Franklin and Watson, uh, as performed by some seventh graders from Oakland, California. Be a scientist since age 15, became a world class one year, follow my dreams. Maurice and I kings were going for DNA. She needs to change her hair, was all that you could say. While you were chasing models, I used my x ray. But what you know about getting your data the hard way? And I showed it was a helix with phosphates on the outside. Calculated helical dimensions, and without my data to play with, you would have taken ages. I was almost there, you could read it in my pages. It had not escaped no. 
statue of dirt. She got no belt for my work. Then the die, so we never know. Not to like recognize it. Not a female scientist, I'm a scientist. Man, look at my work and say, dang, that's a nice pick. pick, pick, pick. Oh! Let me hear you recognize Rosalind Franklin, F R A N K L I. Recognize Rosalind Franklin, F R A N K L I. Recognize Rosalind Franklin, F R A N K L I. Now, I don't know what Franklin would have thought about uh, being portrayed in a rap battle, but my guess is she would have been very pleased about being an inspiration for young people today. What's striking is that the video, like the book, like most of our thinking about Franklin, focuses on DNA. But we can see that that wasn't always the case. Here's her gravestone in the Jewish cemetery in London. And there her family had written on the gravestone that her research and discoveries on viruses remain of lasting benefit to mankind. There's nothing about DNA there. And I'll explain why there's that concentration on viruses at the time during uh, immediately after her death. To understand how she became the woman she was, the scientist she was, we need to go back into her past. She was born into what her biographer has called a frugal rich, very well-known, well-connected British Jewish family. And although they weren't extremely wealthy, they had enough money to be able to send her, for example, to this boarding school when she was a little girl, uh, a boarding school that concentrated on games so that they would learn uh, the ability to have self-control and prompt decision and so on. But more importantly uh, than that was her intellectual ability and a letter from a family member in when she was only six said Rosalind is alarmingly clever she spends all her time doing arithmetic for pleasure and invariably gets the sums right and that's something that she carried on doing for the rest of her life when she was about 11 her parents sent to her an to another school, St Paul's Girls' School in London. Again, a fee-paying school, but this time it was a day school, so she didn't have to stay away, and she could go to school on the bus. She excelled at science and enjoyed games, hockey in particular, and her family went on holidays, for example, to Norway, which was pretty unusual at the time, as well as in the UK, and this gave her a lifelong passion for mountaineering and walking in the hills. In 1938, she got into Munin College, Cambridge, and indeed she did so well in the entrance exam that she was awarded what's called an exhibition, a sum of money, 30 pounds, it was quite a lot of money in those days, but her family decided that they didn't really need that money and they gave it to uh, Jewish refugee children who were fleeing Nazi Germany. While she was at Cambridge, she focused on natural sciences, uh, in particular chemistry and physics, and was very struck by lectures on crystallography, on what you could understand about the molecular structure of materials through studying their crystals. But despite the way that Watson portrays her in the double helix, it wasn't all work. As she said to her parents, please send my evening dress, the tulip one, my evening shoes and my evening petticoat. The shoes are in the bottom drawer of the wardrobe. The gold or the silver will do. When she was in Cambridge, she had an extremely important experience when she met Adrienne Way. Adrienne Way, Way was a, a chemist, a physicist, and a student of Marie Curie. She was a French researcher who had fled uh, the German onrush in the summer of 1940, uh, responding to Charles de Gaulle's call for intellectuals and others to join him in Britain. And she came to Cambridge and gave a lecture. And after the lecture, Franklin went and spoke to her. And it turned out that Vey's mother had worked for Franklin's uncle sometime in the past. The Franklins really were a remarkably well-connected family. However, more importantly than that was that they hit it off as friends, despite the age difference. And uh, Adrian Vey became a mentor, a friend, and a role model for Franklin, showing her how she, you could be a woman scientist in a man's world. And indeed, in 1946, when Franklin was looking for her first job, it was Vey who found her one in Paris. Now, after graduating uh, uh, with her BSc, Franklin went to work 
at the British Coal Utilisation Research Association. And this was an organisation focused on coal research, which was clearly extremely important uh, during the war. And although she did her research at Kingston, which is on the outskirts of London, her, she was registered for a PhD with Cambridge. And you can see that this was a fairly masculine world. She was the only woman uh, in a sea of blokes. Now, her PhD was on the physical chemistry of solid organic colloids with special relation to coal and related materials. And she discovered in her course of her research that carbons could act as molecular sieves, allowing some molecules, very, very small molecules to go through and others would be trapped by it. And this is a principle that's still used uh, in various filters and so on today. After finishing her PhD and with the help of uh, Adrienne Vey, she went to Paris and Paris was really the key moment where she discovered what she really wanted to do. She was working in the Laboratoire Centrale des Services Chimiques de l'État and she was working with Jacques Mering. Uh, this is Jacques Mering here, who was a, a Russian born uh, Frenchman who was the head of the laboratory and an expert in X-ray crystallography. This was the new technique developed uh, by the Braggs in the UK, but now spreading all over the world using X-ray diffraction, the scattering of X-rays as you bombard a crystal to discover something about the molecular structure, the precise or orientation and links between different atoms. And she became tremendously uh, excited this uh, by this. Mering, uh, well, he hadn't actually been a student of Bragg. It was his supervisor who was a student of Bragg. So he was kind of like a, a, an academic grandchild of Bragg. And Franklin was taken both with Mering, who was a tremendously charismatic man, but also with, above all with the technique and with the atmosphere there was in the Paris lab. Here we can see some pictures. Here she is uh, making coffee in crucibles in the lab. Uh, having worked in France, I, I know they do do things a bit differently there. Here's a picture of her looking very happy, sharing a joke with colleagues in Lyon. They're going to a conference. But as well as working, she also went walking in the French countryside. You can see here in uh, pictures, enjoying herself. But above all, what she was doing there was her research and her three key papers on coal, which were eventually published in 1950 and 1951, have been cited over 1800 times, which gives you an indication of the remarkable impact that her work had in that particular field. Now, the money for France ran out and she needed to start looking at an opportunity for work in London. And she contacted John Randall. Randall was a physicist who had recently created the biophysics laboratory at King's College. And this was one of the most exciting areas of post-war science. It involved using the techniques of physics like X-ray crystallography to study organic molecules. So living molecules, not, not dead crystals like the carbon, the coals that she'd been studying in Paris. And they agreed that she would uh, apply for a fellowship, which she obtained in the summer of 1950, to study the X-ray diffraction of proteins. She was due to start at the beginning of 1951, and a few weeks before she um, arrived in the lab, she got a letter from Randall, which said that after very careful consideration and discussion with the senior people concerned, he doesn't mention who they were. We now think it would be better for you to investigate the structure of certain biological fibers. The letter went on to reveal what these mysterious fibers were. Of course, it was DNA. This was quite possibly the first time that Franklin had ever heard of DNA, uh, but she accepted this switch in topic from proteins to uh, DNA. Why not? The other thing that the letter said was that uh, only yourself and Gosling, Gosling was a PhD student, would be doing experiments. So Franklin was led to believe that she'd be arriving in London and would be the sole person working on this field and she would have this PhD student. Now, Randall uh, had been at the very least a bit mischievous and naughty uh, in writing this letter because he hadn't mentioned somebody very important in the lab and that was Morris Wilkins. And Morris Wilkins was not only the deputy head of the lab, so he actually had a, a permanent position. He'd also been carrying out X-ray studies of DNA. Indeed, it was his images of uh, DNA and the crystal structure that had got Jim Watson really excited in using this technique to try and understand the double helix structure of DNA. And Wilkins was 
intending to carry on with doing that. And indeed, Gosling was his PhD student. So he returned from holiday at the beginning of 1951 uh, to discover that not only was Franklin there, he knew she was coming, but he assumed uh, that she was going to be working not so much with him as actually for him. He would be the principal investigator, she would be the postdoc. Franklin had other ideas for a start, that was her way. Secondly, that's exactly what uh, the letter had from Randall had led her to expect. Wilkins also found that he'd now lost his PhD student. He had no idea that any of this was going to happen. Now, that would have been a bad start to any relationship, but more, even more fundamental than that, because, you know, if you have a problem like that, you can talk about it normally. They couldn't. Wilkins and Franklin just did not get on. They had completely different personalities. Franklin had this uh, quite argumentative, boisterous, uh, character that enjoyed the cut and thrust of debate and that was one of the things she liked about the uh, the Paris lab and, and Wilkins was the complete opposite he was almost like a kind of caricature of an Englishman he was very quiet reserved he had this habit of looking away when he was talking to you and above all he hated any kind of conflict so one of the great tragedies of this whole period was that Wilkins and Franklin just could not work together and Randall's whatever it was his letter whatever reason he wrote it in that way the way that things were set up that didn't help either now this is the actual stuff uh, that they were studying these are real samples from the king's college archives and you can see here we've got uh, it says dna signa written on it and signa was the name of a swiss researcher who could produce particularly pure uh, extracts of uh, DNA crystals and he gave this sam these samples to the, the, the lab and you can see here are two samples. Now what they had to do was to string this stuff out, Wilkins later said it was a bit like snot, and you can see here a very high-tech piece of equipment which is a bent paper clip and maybe you can just make out the tiny thread of DNA uh, that's going between the two parts. And what you had to do was to take that paper clip and then you put it in the camera now, the camera is an X-ray camera, so it doesn't look actually anything like uh, the cameras that you might imagine. And you have to lay the fibre across this tiny little hole. And then over here, you would put a square of uh, photographic film and then you would screw the whole thing tight. It had to be in a vacuum, so you'd have a vacuum pump here. Uh, and Wilkins discovered fairly early on that the best way of ensuring there was a vacuum was to wrap the whole thing up in a condom. And this is the actual camera that Wilkins and Franklin both used. And here are some of the images that Franklin was able to obtain. She was renowned for her ability, her experimental skill in obtaining absolutely marvellous images. And this gives you some idea of the complexity of what they were studying. Now, because uh, Franklin and Wilkins wouldn't, couldn't get on, uh, Randall made them work apart. And they discovered together that there were two forms of DNA. There was a, uh, a very dry dehydrated form, which was called the A form. And that's what we can see here. And there was also a more naturally occurring form called the B form. Uh, and Franklin studied mainly the A form and Wilkins studied mainly the B form. It wasn't entirely as straightforward as that. Um, you can see here, this is the A form with this very, very complex uh, image. And what you had to do was to take lots and lots of these images at slightly different orientations with the, both the beam and, the, uh, and the, the crystal thread at a slightly different orientation. And then you would project these onto a wall and you had to measure the distances and the angles. And then using some very complicated maths, and remember, this is a time when you just had uh, slide rules, the slide rules and log tables. There were no computers. There were no even mechanical calculators they had available. You had to calculate something called the Patterson function. And here we can see some examples of her doing these calculations. This is actually from uh, Franklin's notebook uh, to try and work out what underlying form might possibly produce that pattern that that was the trick you had to try and project from these uh, refraction images what might be the molecules and the atoms that were their orientation that could produce that 
Now, Franklin fairly soon became convinced that uh, on the basis of that kind of very complex image of the uh, A-form, that the A-form at least was not helical. And to show that she, though she wasn't at all happy there and she found them a bit of a stuffy bunch and Wilkins the stuffiest of the stuffy, uh, she did, you know, join in the kind of lab banter. She produced this uh, death notice uh, signed by herself and Ray Gosling, the PhD student, to announce that uh, the DNA helix, which everybody assumed that DNA was helical, her evidence did not go along with that from uh, her initial studies of the A form and therefore they announced that it was dead. However, if you uh, read the double helix, you'll see that uh, Watson portrays Franklin as somebody who wanted to let the data speak for herself themselves. She didn't want to uh, analyze the data or come up with a model before she'd finished doing the experiment. And that's absolutely not true. We can see here, here are pages from her lab notebook and she's got the basic data and now she's trying to see what various forms might explain them. And there are different ways you can imagine the orientation of the phosphates and the bases. Uh, and here's a model uh, developed by Sven Ferberg, who'd been a PhD student in King's earlier. And then she's even toying with an idea, well, maybe there are three chains, which is one of the ideas that Linus Pauling came up with, or maybe even four. So she's exploring what might produce the images that she can see. But above all, what you've got to do is some fairly hardcore maths. And this is a, some extracts from a paper. And you can see up here that the method she's going to use is that of Crick. Crick was a PhD student in Cambridge. Uh, and one of the things that he did, which he published in 1952, was to come up with a method for explaining or predicting what patterns you would expect if a molecule was helical. Heli helices were all the rage at the time uh, in, the, in the biophysical world and the molecules that he was working on for his thesis were helical and so he needed a way of trying to understand what images they may, might produce through x-ray crystallography. So the fact that Crick had been doing this and thinking very hard about it is extremely important for understanding why, in the end, Watson and Crick were able to see something that Franklin couldn't. Franklin became convinced by her work that the B form was in fact helical. And we can see here in an article uh, that she was drafting in March 1953 with Ray Gosling where she, she accepts this isn't a proof, but the, D, the B form shows in striking manner the features characteristic of helical structures. Now, Franklin had made it known from the end of 1952 that she really could not stand working uh, in King's any longer. And she was with uh, Randall's agreement, she was going to take her uh, fellowship away to a different London college, which was called Birkbeck. But she was finishing up her work and doing the best she could by her PhD student, uh, who had now been technically transferred to uh, back to Wilkins. So she's writing this on the 17th of March, 1953. And she had no idea, but at that very moment, this was happening. Watson and Crick had not only established that it was a double helix, I mean, that's, that's the easy bit, but they had actually been able to show in very precise atomic detail what the orientation of the various molecules was, the bonds that were linking them, the pitch in terms of the number of turns of the double helix, the gaps between the two uh, strands and so on. A remarkably detailed model. Now, if you read the double helix, uh, this all came about because uh, Wilkins showed Franklin photograph 51, and we saw that the rappers were very interested in photograph 51 as well, and we'll see it uh, later again. It's come to symbolize uh, Franklin's data being stolen uh, by Watson and Crick, is often what you read. Now, there's a whole series of problems for this, and the first one is we are seeing that that is, that is Watson's story. Above all, the photo wasn't even taken by Franklin. Photograph 51 was taken by Gosling and it had been given back to Wilkins with all of Gosling's data by Franklin. So even Ray Gosling later on said that Wilkins was quite within his rights to show this photo uh, to, uh, to Watson. Whether it was the right thing to do is another matter. 
And above all, if you just think about it, well, what could Watson glean from this? He was just shown it for an instant. He says his heart started to pound and, you know, he got very excited. Well, he can get from it what, to be honest, I can get from it. And I'm not, not an X-ray crystallographer at all. That is that it suggests there's a helical structure. But everybody in King's knew this by now. Both the Wilkins group and Franklin accepted that the B form was helical. So photograph 51, despite it's, it's become an icon, and I've, I've given up trying to correct people on Twitter or on the internet to say, well, actually, that's not true. Um, it's become an icon, but that isn't actually the key thing. The key thing was a report from the King's Lab to the Medical Research Council. This was an informal document which, in which each of the researchers summarized their work and Franklin's included what was called the space group data. These were basically four or five fundamental numbers. This is a, a version that she published uh, or she sent out in French in March. So it shows these data weren't terribly secret. Indeed, she'd presented virtually identical data in November 1951 at a seminar in Kings where Watson had been, uh, but Watson to his own admission uh, spent his time thinking about what a hair looked like, what a dress looked like, never took notes and he couldn't remember the numbers. But when Crick was shown these numbers, because Max Perrotts of Cambridge, who was on the MRC panel, gave Watson and Crick uh, the unofficial report in February 1953, that's all that Crick needed to realize that that meant there were two strands of DNA going in opposite directions, forming a double helix. So the question is, why didn't Franklin immediately understand that as well? And the answer is, well, as Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. And Crick had been thinking about exactly that for two or three years. So as soon as he saw the data, he immediately realized what it what it meant. Franklin. Uh, moved on uh, and together with Watson and Crick and Wilkins and uh, his colleagues, she published an article in Nature. There are three articles that appear one after the other in uh, April 1953. And at the end of the Watson and Crick article, which of course contains no data because they didn't have any, at the end of the Watson and Crick article, we have a little statement saying that uh, we have also been stimulated by a knowledge of the general nature of the unpublished experimental re results and ideas of Wilkins and Franklin. Well, that's a bit disingenuous because they had a bit more than the general uh, ideas. And indeed, in 1954, uh, a far more detailed article, given the precise uh, orientation of the atoms in the DNA molecule, or according to the model, uh, Crick and Watson this time uh, said that uh, we wish to point out that without the data from the King's group, the formulation of our structure would have been most unlikely, if not impossible. Well, telling me. So clearly they felt a bit uneasy about where on earth they'd got the key data from, uh, but what was done was done and everybody kind of moved on. Indeed, Franklin moved on to Birkbeck College, which is not quite down the road, but it's only about half a mile away. And she went to work with J.D. Bernal, who was uh, a communist, a notorious womanizer, although Franklin seems to have escaped his clutches. And above all, he was a, a very experienced X-ray crystallographer. He carried out, made some of the first X-ray observations of the tobacco mosaic virus, which is a very well studied uh, plant virus and had become kind of a model for understanding viral function. And Franklin was able to get a three year grant from the British Agricultural Research Council to work on the structure of plant viruses. So this is now her third postdoc she's had. She's had first one uh, was in France, then one working uh, at King's and now she's at Birkbeck, but she's still a postdoc working on a three year kind of perspective. Now, you might say, why, why is she switching topics? Why is she starting to study viruses? Well, I think that's to misunderstand the impact of the double helix. It's to see everything kind of retrospectively, because for us, it looks like the most important discovery that could ever be made. Don't get me wrong. It is extremely significant, but you need to understand it in context. At the time, the genetic role of DNA was still not clear in anything except bacteria and viruses, not everybody accepted it even for them. There was no proof 
that the double helix structure was right. It looked beautiful, it made perfect sense. But both these things, the genetic role of DNA and the double helix structure, were effectively working hypotheses throughout the 1950s and much of the 1960s. Indeed, it's quite staggering that neither of these things were actually proved until the mid 1970s. The genetic role of DNA in eukaryotes was only demonstrated in the mid 1970s, like the double helix structure of DNA. Above all, it was hard to see what you could actually do with that result in that period. Uh, the first challenge was to try and work out, well, how it replicated, how the double helix unwound, and a general principle about that was established at the end of the 1950s. But really, it was not the fundamental breakthrough in terms of opening immediate perspectives for research. Far more important than the molecule itself was what happened to both DNA and RNA in viruses. They were the really exciting thing. And that's why Franklin went for them. And it wasn't just her. Both Crick and Watson both turned to the study of viruses, along with many other of this young generation of researchers using physical approaches to understand the fundamental problems of life. And it's during this final five years or so, four or five years of her life, that really I think she flourishes and she becomes an absolutely brilliant scientist with an international reputation. She publishes 14 major papers on cold DNA and viruses. So she's juggling three very different topics using the same underlying technique, but very, very different ways of approaching the natural world. She studies a series of plant viruses, tobacco, potato, turnip and tomato viruses and the pea. And then in 1956, after the crystallization of the polio virus, the first animal virus to be crystallized, she starts to study polio as well. And this is a, you know, a broad range of uh, viruses that she's studying with different etiologies, with different consequences, and really shows her appetite to understand how these strange infectious diseases work. She begins collaborations with researchers in Berkeley and Yale to begin. I mean, for a a British researcher at the time, this is remarkably kind of cosmopolitan uh, and ambitious. And in 1957, with the Agricultural Research Council refusing to uh, pay her any more money, they said, you've got to get a full time job, a permanent job. She was able to go to the NIH in America uh, and get a grant from them because what she was doing was unique. That was their argument, why they were going to give this British researcher uh, some money. Ironically, her colleagues in Britain, in, in Birkbeck, said, perhaps you've asked for too much money. No, I have too much money. And in 1958, a few months before she died, she began to become interested in what were then called microsomes, these tiny little structures within the cell, which were thought to be associated with protein synthesis, which we now call ribosomes and are made primarily of uh, RNA, but also of proteins. And that was what was she was interested in. This statement uh, that she wrote in a, in a grant application shows, I mean, I, not only a perspective, but it's a, an extraordinary ambition. Our work is concerned with what is probably the most fundamental of all questions concerning the mechanism of living processes, namely the relationship between protein and nucleic acids. And for a young researcher who is in her early 30s to come up with this really bold, clear statement about what she wants to do. I mean, that in and of itself is absolutely remarkable. And as she said, <clears throat> slightly boastfully, but quite rightly, in a letter in no other laboratory, either in this country or elsewhere, is any comparable work on virus structure being undertaken. And that's why the NIH gave her that money, because they knew that she alone would be able to do that work. Now, she wasn't actually alone. One of the great things about Birkbeck was that it gave her the opportunity she hadn't really had in Kings, that she'd missed so much compared to her life uh, in Paris. And that was collaborating with peers and training researchers. Here are just some of the people she collaborated with. Don Casper was an American researcher uh, who was working on the structure of the tobacco mosaic virus. They work together. In fact, she wrote one of his nature papers pretty much. Uh, Ken Holmes was a PhD student and above all, 
Aaron Klug. Aaron Klug was a South African postdoc who came to work with her, bumped into her on the stairs in Birkbeck. She showed him her data and she, he immediately decided he wanted to start working with her. And they formed an absolutely fantastic duo. She was the brilliant experimentalist and he had even more math smarts than she did and was a theoretician who could help to guide her experiments, challenge her, and they could argue. Now, they worked together and Klug, after her death, really for decades, he was the keeper of the flame. He, he reminded people of her significance. He argued after the publication uh, of the Double Helix. And when he won the Nobel Prize in 1982 for his work on the 3D structure of viruses, he emphasized in his acceptance speech the significance of Franklin's work. And he also quite rightly said that had she lived, they would have carried on working together and she would have had a part in that prize. Now, to give you uh, some idea of their, how they felt about her, Ken Holmes said, I would have gone through fire and water for her. But he also accepted that she was prickly and difficult, especially at first, but that you soon got over. And if you could get back over that initial problem, then she was a remarkable person. For Klug, she worked beautifully. Her single-mindedness made her a first-class experimentalist with a sort of skill that blends intelligence and determination. And, you know, that's what you need as a researcher. To be a great researcher, you need insight, single-mindedness, intelligence, determination. She had them all in spades. Here's an example of some of the work she did on the TMV, the tobacco mosaic virus. And you can see that it's far more complicated than the B structure of DNA with its uh, little X. This is the kind of image that she had to project onto the wall and then measure the distances and the angles. Now, Jim Watson had suggested that maybe the uh, TMV was a spiral, that the proteins formed a spiral and that the uh, RNA because it's an RNA virus, formed something like the wick in a candle in the middle of this spiral. Franklin was able to show that that intuition was correct, but above all, she was able to improve on his measures because she took much better pictures than she did. She, he did. She was a much better experimentalist and was able to work out in a series of papers, gradually refining her measures, exactly the number of units there were in each circle, in each spiral, at the pitch at which they were oriented, and above all, she was able to show that the RNA is not down the middle like a wick, but is instead threaded through the, uh, the proteins that make up the outer shell of the virus. Now, she shared all those ideas with Watson. She wrote him a series of letters. You can see them all in the Watson archives in the Cold Spring Harbor uh, laboratory archives. And here we can see a couple of examples where she's showing him the different versions of uh, the model there may be and what the implications of that structure you might expect. She actually got on with Watson pretty well. Uh, in 1955, during a, uh, a visit to America or planning a visit to America, she wrote to Dear Jim uh, and she says, Matt, that's Matt Measleson. Measle Matt tells me that you might be uh, traveling, driving from Chicago to Pasadena about the same time as I go there and might have space for me. If the dates are right, I'd love to come with you. So she's inviting herself to go on a transcontinental drive with uh, Jim Watson and Sidney Brenner. Now, as it happened, uh, the, um, the dates weren't right. She couldn't fit it in. So she uh, went her way by visiting labs, a whole series of labs on her visit. But later she did go out for a long drive uh, to, with them in Pasadena, where they took her to the uh, seedier parts of uh, town I think they were probably trying to shock her. Um, she didn't give any uh, any evidence of that in in to them. She didn't give them the satisfaction, though she did say in the letters that she was uh, a bit shocked. In general, during this period, re reading her her life, you can see that she's traveling widely. She she discovered air travel uh, in the early 1950s and loved it because it enabled her to travel to visit for quite long periods. I mean, sometimes I was reading it thinking, well, why weren't you in the lab all this time? Uh, she went for conferences and on holidays to Germany, Paris, Israel, Strasbourg, Zagreb, Italy, Paris again. A long, that long visit to the USA in 1955, which where she was fated not only for her viral work, but also for her coal work. She visited a number of coal labs. Uh, she went to Madrid. That's where this photo was taken. She got on particularly well 
with Francis Crick and his wife Odile. Uh, she was very friendly, she admired Crick. Uh, and these three men are probably the scientists, I think, um, uh, apart from Mering, that she admired the most, Crick, uh, Casper and Klug. She got on remarkably well with all three of them. Uh, this is in Spain, and after the Madrid conference, they went on a. Uh, she and the Cricks went on a, a tour around parts of Spain, and then she went back to the USA again in 1956 uh, and said, "I have completely fallen for Southern California." Now, sadly, it was also on this trip that she had the first symptoms uh, of her ovarian cancer. She returned to London. Uh, she had a first operation, and she convalesced with the Cricks in Cambridge. So again, that indicates that this was all part of a group. These were a series of young, brilliant researchers striking out in new fields, and new lives. Sadly not for Rosalind. In 1957, there were further complications, another operation, and the surgeon uh, basically suggested to her that she had terminal cancer and she should prepare, put her affairs in order. Now, she insisted on having experimental cobalt radiotherapy and above all, she continued working. And there are stories from her postgrads and uh, her colleagues that she would even crawl upstairs. Sometimes she had to crawl upstairs at Birkbeck because she was so weak to get to the lab. One of the final things she did in this period was a piece of what we would now call public engagement. Uh, in 1958, the World's Fair took place in Belgium. This was the first World's Fair after the war. And there was a big science and engineering uh, pavilion. And what she did was to, uh, together with her researchers, they made two huge models of uh, the TMV here. You can see the, the spiral structure and of the polio virus, which they just start, started working on. And these were exhibited along with a big double helix from Morris Wilkins. And uh, here we can see, in fact, these models being shown on BBC when Sidney Brenner on the right was interviewed by the famous British journalist Raymond Baxter in front of those models. Sadly, even before the expo opened, Franklin died. On 16th of April, uh, 1958, she died. And this photo was taken of the lab empty after her death. Now, this was a remarkable, remarkable event in that it was, it was it's great significance. Uh, her death was announced in both the London Times and also in the New York Times, which gives you some indication of quite how significant she was. The London, uh, the New London Times obituary was written by Bernal, who she, lab she worked in, uh, and it was a heartfelt description of her life and his distress at her death. And this was even clearer in his long version of the obituary which was published in Nature. Miss Franklin was distinguished by extreme clarity and perfection in everything she undertook. When he says Miss, he's being polite, it's not uh, being condescending. It was the usage of the time. Her photos among the most beautiful x-ray photographs of any substance ever taken. At the same time, she proved to be an admirable director of a research team and inspired those who worked with her to reach the same high standard. And you can see that Bernal is there saying, look, she's a, a fully formed mature scientist. She has her own group. She has her own lab. She can lead them. She can inspire them. She can carry out fantastic work. What a great loss. And indeed, uh, we tend today to get a bit focused on Nobel Prizes. I've mentioned them already, I'm afraid. But I think Brenda Maddox, who wrote the best biography of Franklin, got it right when she concluded her lost prize was life. Now, since her death, she's become extremely well known. Uh, there is now a blue plaque, uh, which is a very uh, prestigious thing to have to mark where she lived in Fulham in London. Uh, there's a Rosalind Franklin University near Chicago, the University of Medicine and Science. There's the Rosalind Franklin Society, which of course is hosting this uh, meeting and which is, whose role is to celebrate the life work and symbolic power of this remarkable heroine in science. In the UK, we have a Royal Society medal and an Institute of Physics medal, both of them in, them in her name. Uh, and we even have a coin, a coin uh, with photograph 51 on it. Unfortunately, well, I, let's take what we can get. It's great. We've got a photograph of Franklin. We've got a, a coin with Franklin's name on it and a cheeky little DNA. Uh, 
unfortunately i hadn't had one of these in my change yet but that's i guess because of who has changed these days um and also it's a bit of a shame that it's a 50p coin and not a 51p coin that would have been better there's a play been made about uh, her this, the moment the dna moment again it's focusing on photograph 51 but never mind uh play by uh, anna ziegler with nicole kidman playing uh franklin on the london stage and as nature said in its recent centenary memorial to her in her edi its editorial that it's a travesty that she's mostly remembered as the wronged heroine of DNA. As I've tried to show you, she was so much more than that. Her work in particular on viruses was extraordinary and would have taken, taken the whole of science in different directions had she lived. Now, if you want to know more, then Brenda Maddox's fantastic biography is just marvellous. And this scientific, this his article by historians of science, Angela Krieger and Gregory Morgan, which appeared in uh, ISIS, which is a history of science journal after the double helix. It focuses on her, those last four or five years of her work and really gives some insight into its significance. So with that, I will finish and say goodbye. And thank you. And thank you, Rosalind Franklin, for being such an inspiration. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. All right, a final reminder that we would love to get your questions. There's still time, so use the Q&A uh, button that you see on your screen and, uh, and enter your question. We'll be archiving today's webinar so you can view it, and indeed the whole Women in Science series uh, on demand or share with colleagues. All right. It's time for our question and answer session with Matthew Cobb. Let's bring him back and just give us a couple of moments to transition into the Q&A session.